All right. So, Patrick, Patricia, hi. Patty squared. Hello. Patty squared. Ooh. Ooh. And then my name, Zach. Zach. Who cares? Want to talk? There's a lot of people will tell you if you make a Google search, if you contact a bank, if you talk to a real estate agent, hey, here's what to do first when you're looking to buy a home. I think a lot of it's basic. I think a lot of it's uh, doesn't get granular. And I think a lot of people inevitably still have tons of questions, walk into the home buying process still super confused. And ultimately, I, I feel as the agents we are, which correct me if I'm wrong, I feel a lot of times we're more real estate educators and matchmakers with the client and the property, more so ever than salesmen. Yeah. And especially in our position of being educators, I, I hate when somebody walks into the process already pre-approved, thinking they're ready to go, and, and what it turns out via a couple questions, they still have no idea what's going on. So I, I want this video to be for that person so that we can kind of talk about our experiences, what we've had with our clients, what's going on in the market right now, 2024, and, and what people need to do in this market. Because I, I think I go without... Any uh, any argument that this market's much different from any market that we've had before, and the way we need to prepare for it and act on it is ultimately going to be different. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, sounds good. Um, let's get rocking with an easy one. Um, if someone's looking to get started in any process in changing locations, they got to think buy, rent, family. What are you seeing right now as the main options for shelter? Let's start there. Just places to rest your head. What are your options out there right now? I mean, you can always buy but there's always the option of rent I yeah mean, if you want to pay somebody else's mortgage and that's fine that's always there's always options out there for you it's just that getting into a rental i feel like is significantly harder than buying a house sometimes these days that's fair um but getting qualified to purchase a home is not always the easiest thing and it's not always the most available sure right now for everybody yeah and the differences between let's talk about the differences between those two because someone might be having that discussion do i buy do i rent you're right renting isn't like what it was now no it's like I feel like you used to be able to just kind of, you could go out and shop 12, 20 rentals and, and pick the one of your choosing if you wanted to rent. And now it's just like, you either got this or nothing. Yeah. yeah. What do you think? I mean, it's one of those things where a lot of places, like they're still wanting three times the amount that mm -hmm. you even make and the affordability yeah. to even get into the rental. Three times the rental amount in right. their income. Yeah. Yes. So, so meaning if they, like if the rent's $2,500, you got to yeah. make 7500 They're wanting the security deposit, pet deposit. I mean, all these extra little things, but they also add up. Exactly. It's so hard. And all those things, you, you get first met last month's rent. Let's say yep. $2,500, right? Yep. First last month's rent, the uh, deposit. And then if you have a pet deposit, a lot of times it's half of the other deposit. Mm -hmm. So you're looking right there at like $8,000, $9,000 just to get into a rental property. Mm -hmm. Where you probably do have to have a 620-ish credit score. They want to make sure you have a secure job and income coming in. So just like you said, it's kind of just as difficult to buy a home, if not more. Yes. What What are the options then for someone looking to buy? Let's talk mortgages. So if I decide, okay, I for both buying and renting, I need to have a 620 credit score. Mm -hmm. For both buying and renting, unfortunately in this market, I'm going to have to probably bring $1,800 a month at minimum to the table as a mortgage or rental payment. Would you guys disagree with that? That's, that's pretty run of the mill, yeah. So if, if I'm understanding of that, and I, I have to do one or the other. Do you favor buying? For the long term, yes. Always. Purchasing is the best option. But I mean, if you're going to be in an area for like, say, 12 months. Buying, yeah, two buying, years less, maybe. Yeah, buying might not be the best option unless you plan on holding it and keeping it after you after you leave. Mm. What, do you, what do you say to people then that are military coming into the area who may not know when or if they may have to leave the area? If you're in the military, because of the inter infrastructure of, like, seniority that you have inside your established, like, career, mm -hmm. it's I, I feel like it's 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 a no-brainer to wherever there's, like, a military base or where other people could be PCSing to and all that stuff. Get involved with the rental because and try – and I mean, you're not supposed to niche down and pick somebody from the military grade, mm -hmm. but I'm sure that there's plenty of military buddies that could end up burning your house. Um, and if there's any issues with it – somebody doesn't pay your mortgage, you can literally just go up the chain of command and even know that you're not in the area. Under, okay, got it, got it, got it. So you're, you're talking about mm -hmm. if you're in the area, there's no reason you shouldn't buy because if you leave the area, it's no problem to rent that out to someone within your own unit, squadron, right there on base. Yes. And if there's an issue with them paying, you're right. The military is very strict 
on things like their credit and making sure payments are up to date. And you're right, you can fly right up the chain of command if there's an issue with payment. You're absolutely yep. correct. So that's, that's a great point for military if you're looking to buy, because if you do leave that area, uh, because of the VA loan, I have seen it where people walk in, they get that 100% financing, and then they're told nine months later they're leaving, yep. and, and they don't have enough equity to sell yet. But the beauty of it is, is a lot of times, especially in these areas around the base, there's plenty of people looking to rent. And at a time like now, I don't think there's ever been a bigger demand for rentals. So that's a great point. If you can buy, there's that benefit on the back end. So let's talk mortgages. What type of mortgages are out there? There's so many. Let's let's break them down. First time home buyer, I'm looking to buy, don't know any of them. Let's talk Barney style about mortgage. Oh, Perfect. well, if you're going to be going into your first time home buying, at least in the state of Delaware, you're going to go through an FHA loan and they're pro unless you're VA, you're probably going to be buying, going through an FHA program, which is 3.5% down, and you're probably going to get DISHA assistance if it's available, which is Delaware State Housing Authority, and it's going to cover that 3.5%. So you're all basically getting 100% financing as far as the down payment and all that stuff. Too. Sure. Yeah. And the, like you said, the VA loan, that's a military-based loan. If you've deployed or done over four years, I believe, active duty, maybe it's five. It switches around. Yeah, it does uh, switch around. You get your certificate of eligibility. One that's not mentioned, though, is the USDA loan. Yep. Common one in, in Delaware, the price points of homes mixed with the income limits on that loan product, though, have started to make it a little bit more difficult yeah. to find the right person for that. That used to be a really common one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you basically have to find somebody that has that makes the, the exact right amount as far as their yearly income. Correct. With zero debt. Z that's that's where it is. You have to have next to no debt. You have to essentially live a very clean lifestyle financially. Broke enough <laughs> to where the mortgage is going to be the only thing on your credit, basically, in order to meet those requirements. Well, and, and, and when you look at today, like you get a car. It used to be, okay, you have a two fifty a month payment on your record for a car. Yep. or you know, And now that's seven fifty yep. for a lot of people. So you're right. You have to get those debts down or else you're going to have to make too much and you'll be above the income limit, and you can't take advantage of the USDA loan. And outside of city limits, too. Yes, it's got to be outside of city limits, which yeah. a lot of Kent County and most of Sussex without the beaches is considered USDA yep. eligible, which is 100% financing. Closing costs, though, do come on top of all of these. We'll mention that. Uh, but you mentioned DISHA. Let's talk more DISHA, Delaware State Housing Authority. Everyone asks about what are the first-time homebuyer programs, what, what are the first-time homebuyer grants and benefits and that's to Delaware. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. Keep going. And that's not even a first-time home buyer's program. It's, like, yeah. you can you can become you can become re-eligible to use that program again if you meet if you meet the requirements for the loan. Yeah. Well, the sec the silent second mortgage for the house. Absolutely. And the beautiful part about Disha too is you can take out money for the down payment and like for example, you said FHA is three point five percent. You could borrow five percent of the purchase price from Disha. Yes. And that remaining 1.5% can be used towards the closing costs. Yep. We haven't even brought that up of like, how much money should I truly have saved? Because I feel like most people just assume down payment. They hear that a lot mm -hmm. and they think that's the money I need. But they don't consider closing, closing costs. costs. Um, and a lot don't even know about closing cost assistance or what closing costs are or how they differ from home to home, area to area. Mm -hmm. So... Let's, let's finish the, the mortgage talk. We mentioned FHA, that's 3.5% down. Uh, you're going to have, that's the most common loan product. Uh, yes. It, it's the, definitely the most utilized. And I mean, once it, the, the moment that you get the government involved with any of these government-backed loans, USDA, FHA, VA, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's other ones that I'm forgetting about, <laughs> um, the moment that the government gets involved, the appraisal is going to be more strict because a little bit, there's a yep. lot more red tape because the government's going to make sure that their investment is be going to be taken care of and utilized correctly, and they're not going to sell you something um, that's going to cause it to deteriorate in value over time. They're going to have all those basic things rectified, at least during the purchase. Absolutely. And they're it, not going to give you the money for the loan. They're not. It's a common, uh, what's the word? I thought it was funny when I heard it, myth understanding that a VA in, uh, appraisal is going to be more strict oh. than any other appraisal. No. I've and it's heard just that so, often. so often, right? Yep. It all is from the same pool. The banks, when, when they start the mortgage process, the underwriters submit that they need a government appraiser, and that's it. So USDA, VA, FHA, same appraiser pool. Yep. And then a random one gets selected from yes. the area. That That's how it goes. So banks don't have any say on who goes out and for an FHA or, or, or VA, it's the same one. Yes. I do that so often. Mm -hmm. Common myth understanding. But the thing is, like, 
not everything is going to get caught on that appraisal too. No, like, and we'll mention that because that's a big one. Repairs, inspections, who pays for them. We'll cover that. Got a lot of topics we'll cover. And we got it chaptered out at the bottom. So feel free to use your mouse or, or thumb to kind of look at the little scroller below to see like different topics um, and what we're talking about because there's a lot to go over. Um, let's finish out the mortgage talk. Um, so USDA, 100%. Again, income limits. That's a great one to talk to a realtor lender on that's local to figure out if you could qualify. FHA, 3.5%. VA, uh, 100%. Mm-hmm. And if it's your first time, you don't even have to pay the funding fee. Yep. And other ones, conventional. Mm-hmm. Conventional is usually going to be the best option for someone walking in with equity or a lot of savings to utilize toward the next home. That's when it's going to mathematically probably start to make more sense for you. Otherwise, you can do a 5% down. It usually doesn't make more sense usually than the FHA. Yeah, the rate, the, rate, the rate difference is completely easy. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. So uh, that's really the breakdown of mortgages. Obviously, if you're coming with partial cash from a home you're selling in another area, it starts to get murky and it's personal to your scenario as to what you should do. So at that point, especially if you own a home, you probably should be connecting with a, a lender in the area you're going to or a realtor in the area you're going to to have that discussion to get into the weeds of that specific scenario. Any, yeah. Anything else you guys would? If they, need to help, if they need any help finding that realtor in the area, just contact us. We have. Are you sure? <laughs> I don't know if I trust us. Do you trust us? Shut up. <laughs> I trust <laughs> us, yeah. You can absolutely <laughs> reach out to us. So, um, all right, can we mention that? How much should be saved? How much money should you have saved? Man, I've seen people, it's, it's, it's like needle in the haystack situation, but I've seen people with less than seven thousand dollars be able to scrape by the skin of their teeth and get into a house. So we say we would say that's like the bare minimum. I yeah. would say bare minimum. Bare yeah. minimum seven thousand. Yeah. Okay. So and what? Go. I'm sorry. And you're probably not. Picking's going to be slim. So picking's going to be slim. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. what were you going to say? I would like to say like the average of ten. Ten. At least ten. More I mean, favorable. I I have a client right now. She's got five grand. So, and we are getting her there, but I mean, it's like you said, it's a needle in a haystack, it's scraping and it's mm-hmm. rough, but if you can have the additional funds and say 10, that would be ideal. And this drastically changes depending on what county in the state of Delaware you're looking and purchasing. Yeah. Seven grand will never fly in Newcastle County. I would say you probably need to have at least a minimum of 15 grand unless you're going to be looking into the center parts of Wilmington. Sure. Um, Especially if you're above the canal. Yes. And there's other grants, too. Like, Sussex County occasionally has grants, too. Yes. So. And City of Dover and different downtowns sometimes will have grants. But ultimately, Delaware State Housing Authority is one that right now just got funded. It just got refunded. So now is the opportunity. I think they timed it around knowing the spring market's coming. So so if you're a first-time home buyer or, like you said, just haven't bought in a while in Delaware and could requalify for it, it's time to ask about it because the money is finite. Like, they will run out of money. They are going to run out of money. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. We'll run out of money. By the way, I'm so mad that the word infinite doesn't l- lead to the word finite being the word finite. <laughs> that doesn't make sense to me. I said it in class one time. It was like 11th grade. I said that finite, and everyone laughed at me. People are like, you dummies. People. It's infinite. <laughs> like, why would we change it when we shorten it? Let's get back to this. People aren't here. <laughs> 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 All right. So how much money... Um. Preferred, you said average 10, minimum yeah. seven. Could I go out and say, I'd like to personally see anywhere between 12 and 15,000? That's like a good range. Yeah, no, if you have 15,000, call us. Yeah, like, n- now you're in like green yeah. go, yeah. less yeah. yellow. I don't give a, I don't give a damn if you got one grand. That's like, fair, yeah. Call me. Very like, clear, very clear. Like, like you could be have $5 in your savings and we can sit down and have a conversation <laughs> about what's going to be realistic so you don't have to guess at this yeah. so we can put you in a better position to make you more mortgage ready when you are. And we're going to go over that. Looking to buy in 2025, anyone sitting there in that position thing, this is a wash for the next 12, 18, 24 months, stick around because we're having that discussion on what you should do in that scenario too because yeah. that's very true. Um, what about credit issues? How do, you, how do we need to get them fixed and what's considered an issue that needs to get fixed as opposed to something that's just like, eh, I'll give an example. Mm-hmm. A lot of people won't go into the home buying process because they have student loan debt. Yeah. And they have, oh, you know, man. 86 grand in student loan debt and think that big number means I can't get a mortgage. But because those are, you know, we could talk about how poorly structured they are for, yeah. for students. But regardless, the longevity of the loan means that the bank only cares about the monthly payment. Yep. They're only looking at the 100 bucks, $86, 150 bucks, whatever it is that you're paying toward 
the big amount. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're worried about your monthly income. Yeah. Your monthly income and your monthly expenses. Exactly. The monthly minimum expenses. Same goes with a credit card. If you owe more than 20 grand, 10 grand, they're only looking at the monthly minimum yeah. every single time. What other credit issues are we running into or myth understandings about it? I feel like a lot of people get medical um, mm. debt incorrect. They think that that's also a big hit, but the lenders, from my understanding, they don't care about the medical bills. As much. Yes. Correct. And I do know for a fact, speaking just overall credit score wise, if you eliminate the credit or I'm sorry, the medical debt from your credit, mm -hmm. it will be as if it was never there. You cannot accumulate long-term historical damage to your credit score once that debt is paid. Okay. Is it, and it, they were trying to make it so that medical debt just overall didn't affect your credit yeah. score, which to me, I fully agree should. with that. As like, if somebody has a heart attack, that doesn't tell me they're not good at paying back their credit card. They, yeah. just, they had a heart attack. <laughs> but I get the other side of the argument. What, what, what do you think? I'm just thinking establishing credit is, like, a big thing, big too. Deal. Let's like, talk about that. Like, if... It's 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 tough out there to buy a house when you don't have any revolving credit in your history. That was the problem that I dealt with is that I had no delinquent payments, but I just didn't have a lot of credit history. Like my credit limit was like three hundred dollars on a secure credit card that I had closed out for five years ago when I went through that process. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's super important if you're looking to try and purchase, let's just say in the next twelve months, get a car that's use car that's super cheap that you can finance the payments down to super super low like or cash which but again now we're talking you can't even get a car for less than 7500 bucks you can go to the back of the lot and you can get, you can <laughs> go to the back of the lot and get a car for less we than don't want anyone dollars. risking their lives over their car but yeah yeah, you, yeah you're right you can you can go to the back of the lot and find something for five thousand dollars that will help you buy it by that yeah. you can finance for the short term yeah and help you purchase your house later on yeah and get to be clear the person watching this video I'm assuming that that you're not one of the people who is living way beyond their means. Because that's the first step towards not being able to buy property in any generation, if, not just if now. If you make three grand a month and a third of that is your car payment, Ugh, you're done. You're, at least for right now until yeah. you figure that out. You're like, absolutely done. You're, you're, you're ap and, and that's a tough topic, and we're not going to hit it right now. But, but making sure you're living within or below your means for the time is absolutely a step that I talk with clients about, especially that are months or years out from being able to buy property. Yep. Yeah. All right. So credit issues, how to fix them. Another topic is the fact that lenders, especially ours over at Whitecap, have access to like the language of the credit score and they can do a soft pull of your credit and the machine, the mechanism that knows the language will say, hey, pay this down to this, do move this to that and make sure this account says this by here and your credit score is going to go up 28 points. Yeah. If you contact us and you're trying to get mortgage ready and you're serious about the situation, we're not just going to tell you, oh, save your money. Like we're yeah. going to give you specifics about what you have to do. Yeah. Anyone who had playback speed up to like 1.25 <laughs> right there is going to have to rewind it. <laughs> but that was a perfect take. Oh, man. Um, all right. Is it actually harder to buy? Next topic I have down, I have like 28 of them. Is it actually harder to buy now than it was in years prior? Yes. yes. Why? I mean, price points alone. I bought back in 17 and my house was... 2017, not yes. 1917. Okay, just be clear. Just <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'm that old. Um, but I bought it, and it was for $144,000. You can't find that anymore. Like, no. it, it doesn't exist. Not a mortgageable home. Absolutely not. It can be mortgageable, but it'll be on leased land. <laughs> yeah. You can get yourself a trailer in a trailer park. Or, or a home with, like, we, we won't get into, like, 203K, like, renovation loans. Yep. I've like, never... People people are so scared by that loan product. Yeah, I've done three of those. So if anyone's looking into a, relo a renovation loan... A 203K uh, is FHA's version. The VA also has a renovation yep. loan, a lot of people don't know about, where you can get into a home that needs a lot of work, it's not mortgageable, and basically they'll finance the repairs. It's a lot of formula and a lot of math to make sure that home works. Yep. Uh, but I've done a few, it was a perfect situation, and it worked. Yeah. But And that's when rates, because they rates add were on. Lower. Yeah, rates were say. normally higher for it. Yeah, exactly. It's hard. And the cost of work yeah. for getting the repairs is now higher. So it's a tougher one to make work. So yes, back five years ago, five, six years easier ago. Easier to buy a home. Easier to buy. The prices were way lower. The interest rates were also way lower. Yeah. I think we got ours at 3%. Okay. So. So where's the relief? Oh. All right, cool. We're just going to have a little lull in the, if everyone's looking at the audio <laughs> levels <laughs> of the podcast. Be more specific, <laughs> relief in what? Relief for the person looking at no options. Mm. Because, to be clear, anybody who can still go out and, you know, support 
something that's a third of their monthly payment, or I'm sorry, a third of their income is a monthly payment. You make six grand, you can support the 2K and you can live and you can build your equity month after month after month, year after year. Buy, buy right now, yes. buy last month, buy next week. Buy yesterday. I want to talk to the people and I'm curious your opinion on what the options are for the person who has no options. The person who's living with their family and I don't know, anywhere from 18, 20, or like 16, you could be thinking about this right now, all the way up to 26, 36 years old. I don't see an option for me. My credit's not supportive enough for me to get a rental property. My income's not high enough for a longer, not going to period to be able to buy a property. And I'm not seeing anybody talking about when it's all going to become a little easier. Because I'll give an example. I'm very empathetic to this. When I got started as an agent 2016, 2017, I'm younger. The average agent's 55 plus years old. I was 25 years old. So a lot of my 25 and younger friends are wanting to buy a property. And frankly, it was possible to buy a $180,000 home with a USDA loan for 100% financing with them making $2,500 a month, three grand a month, and had a car and a kid and a wife, and it was sustainable. Yep. Now, that's far gone. Yeah, no, I was about to say, if, if, if you're a single person trying to buy your first home solo, mm -hmm. unless you're making six figures, it's, it's, it's really tough. Yeah, absolutely. And, not, and to, to add statistics to that, so you shouldn't feel bad because that's 86% currently of the country. Yep. As of a month and a half ago, that stat came out that 86% of individuals in America could not qualify for the median home in America. That's terrifying. Yes. So you're absolutely right. What do they do? It's one of those things where I have single clients right now, great jobs, they're struggling. And if you are living with family and you don't have a way out, as bad as this sounds, if your job's not cutting it, you've got to change jobs or you've got to get another one. Like That's what I was going to say. There's there's no way to better your situation without making more money. Yeah. Without making more money. If you're not making money or putting that money that you're making currently towards your credit to to you know fix that, I just don't see a way out. A way out. Mm -hmm. So like a way out from where they're at. Yeah. Getting yep. into the next property. So what should that person be doing? Not missing payments. On anything. On anything as far as credit. Um, and that's pretty much anything that involves if you, a monthly payment, right? Yeah. If you can't guarantee the fact that you're going to purchase, and I know things come up. Trust me. I've had it happen to me time and time again where things come up. But if you aren't in a position to where you can easily pay that amount off, don't put it on your credit card. Make more of a wise decision. I mean, if you have to, you have to. There's things that have to happen. But don't screw up your credit if you can't. And basically, if if your income limits are restricting you from being able to purchase a home, there's only one thing that you, you can do to fix it is make more money. And I think what other people want the solution to be is for home prices to be lower instead of income having to go higher. And yeah. People don't realize that's not going to happen. Well, I'm people too. I want home prices lower. Yeah. I mean, I don't want us to, like, because we're not different than anyone listening to this. Yeah. All, all of us would rather home prices be lower for one reason or another. I, I would like to have a second home that's up here in Dover or at least be able to sell the current home or make a rental for somebody else, someone within the team yeah. even, as a rental property. It's not an option at this exact moment that's feasible because of the office and different financial situations. But if we had slightly lower rates, then it would be something that my personal independent contractor income can support. And I speak for a lot of independent contractors that try to make, you know, not cheating on taxes. Right. But you're not trying to pay a bajillion to the IRS. Yeah, I'm not trying to pay $32,000. Exactly. So you're claiming as little as you can income-wise. You do that for a few years, and now you qualify for a mortgage. Well, say you do that for two, three years, and now all of a sudden everything's more expensive. Right. Now you don't qualify. So, I, it, and I'm in that scenario where I have to now go through two more years of doing it again so that my average is higher and I can so there's a lot of different issues that are coming up, but we're not speaking to the second buyer. We're talking to the first time home buyer, and I would love to know for them, should they be considering foreclosures, short sales, and other type of like pre-foreclosure options that they may be seeing on like Zillow and other things? Unless you're A, have a lot of cash, okay, or B, pretty handy, I would kind of stay astray from those types of properties. Okay, why? Usually- I like your take on that. Um, usually foreclosures, short sales- all those stuff, you're running into a distressed property, I would say 85% of the time. Maybe 15% of the time the house isn't distressed per se, but the utilities are off, water's shut off, 
and you're not even going to be able to get an appraisal without being able to cut those things on at your own expense. Yes. Um, so it's, it's a little bit, there's a lot more weeds, a lot more stuff that you have to just basically dive through. And when it's a desirable property, that's priced low because the bank just wants it gone and they just want to make sure that their notes paid off. Mm -hmm. Like just know that you're going up against so many people that are just going, going to be trying to purchase this thing, thing outright cash. Yes. Yes. Um, I think too, people don't think, uh, what someone really has to go through for foreclosure to happen. Yeah. Yeah. In Delaware, it's a six month process minimum of not paying. And anything. I don't and I don't think that you're paying your mortgage and just like, all right, let's keep this place as clean exactly. as possible. Exactly. Exactly. Like, you're not worried about that. Yeah. And and then then the bank takes it over and it doesn't go right onto the market. We're talking three, six, sometimes a a month can turn into a year for them getting a home onto the market. So you're talking about a property where the, the air conditioning hasn't been on for eight months. You know, the water hasn't been running. Like, there's there's going to be issues. Like you said, uh, maybe something to stay astray from if you don't have the extra cash or the experience in working with, like, properties. Yeah. yeah. And fixing them. Big issues. And I'm not saying that you have to be able to rebuild something from scratch, but you're probably going to have to do a lot of maintenance to the home. Sure. Or have yeah. the money to be able to have someone do it. Cool. Um, can we discuss a, a, a kind of a side topic from that? Trailers, double wides, and Class C. Um, that's a little different. Uh, people kind of in a similar category, though. You're looking for a cheaper opportunity, cheaper option. I had a discussion it's, with somebody yesterday on, uh, no, I want to hear that, but I had a discussion yesterday with somebody on Clayton Homes. That's a common one. It's not really the cheaper option. Okay. Um, banks find it a little bit more risky. You're going to be having a higher monthly payment because it's a manufactured home. Um, Great point. And, and, and the majority of the time, it's going to be on leased land that you don't even own. Yeah, that's the one you want to stay away from. I wouldn't even say... The only time I've seen manufactured homes go for the same price as ranchers. Yeah. They're getting expensive. And, I mean, if you have the, the correctly built manufactured home, like, there are some nice ones. Like, yeah. don't get me wrong, but if you're usually wheeling that thing in and it still has axles on it, it's not going to be – it's it's a car. It's, it's yeah. a depreciating asset. It's not going to be worth anything. And, honestly, you can't even finance one unless, unless it was built after 1976. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the – other side topics on that, uh, it has to be or usually should be considered a Class C property if you want to finance it, uh, and that means it's on a permanent foundation, those two or three cement block layers underneath. Uh, if it's not, like you said, if it has, like, the skirting and then yeah. the axles underneath, that's still a car. Yeah. It's registered with the DMV. It's a depreciating asset. Yes. And if it's been moved from that spot at all, it's no longer financeable. Right. Once it's been moved a second time, it is no longer financeable. And a lot of people do, though, put manufactured and mobile in the same category. It's not necessarily the same thing all the time. Manufactured just means it was made off-site. Yes. A lot of times that does apply to single-wides and double-wides. <clears throat> but there's companies like Barica, used to be Nanacoke, uh, that will create stick-built homes, single-family properties, mm -hmm. in a factory, off-site, outside of the elements, and then transport the home in. Some people would argue that's going to build a better home. Some people hate that. But there, there are differences between manufactured and mobile, and there are deals to be had, but you're absolutely right. Because of the risk to the investor on the mortgage side, it usually kind of ends up being a similar cost. Yep. Right. All right. We're flying through this. How are y'all doing? Good. good. Anything we've missed that we've kind of flown over that maybe we should go into more detail on? I think we're good. Flying? Yeah, keep going. Hell yeah. <laughs> All right. So I want to talk about buying with someone versus buying on their own looking to buy gets their mom on there their wife their husband their sister what what are the do's and don'ts and the regulations around being able to do that because i'd start with you know it's a lot more common to think you can than what actually ends up usually happening a lot of people are more wishful about it well things with the va if you're if you're using a va loan okay um and your spouse isn't also va eligible that adds a lot more closing costs to the picture if they're going to be put on the note as far as the house which is the loan mm -hmm. um and, and just speaking just empathetically, like, be sure that person that you're buying a house with is just somebody that you're just going to be okay with owning this house with for the rest of your guys. Yeah. We lives. could have that topic for the rest of the video. Yeah, uh, that's a tough one. That's, that's honestly, I feel like the military should not allow people to buy a house with another military person that they're married to. Whoa. <laughs> military Whoa. wife, what do you think? <laughs> I don't know. We're not going to go there. <laughs> 
I just feel like a lot of the times people are just like, oh man, we're both in the military. Let's like buy this house together. And then like three months later, like, I don't even know you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think that that might come down to the fact that you just get married a little bit too early. I was going to say, it's not just military, but. No, but it's not just military. It is not. As a, well, there's the joke and it is a non-empathetic joke that the best clients to have are first time home buyers that are dating because it's two sales. They're going to split up and eventually you're going to list it in six months. And I, it's a joke. <laughs> it's such a bad joke. It's such a bad joke, but I can't tell you how many times that's happened. Oh, I'm sure. An obnoxious amount of times. Sure. People that all the way from my first year, you know, and, and they lasted five, six years or five, six months, five, six weeks. Not saying don't buy a home unless you're married. Not saying you have to have a certificate to declare your relationship and your love for somebody. You could buy a house with some guy you just met on the street. Absolutely. You <laughs> could have your mom on it. You could have a sister-in-law. You could have a friend. I bought with my boyfriend, so. There you go. And now you're married and, and things are going And hey, she is one of the few situations. <laughs> Not few. It works. It works. <laughs> it works. It works. It's just like you said. You said it best. It's something you need to really think about. Yeah. Yes. If you're going in on this 30-year deal with just somebody. Just because you can buy a house with somebody doesn't mean you should. <laughs> Quote of the video. <laughs> Absolutely. So, but going into that, they need to have the same credit score requirements as you. They need to have income just like you do. They need to have a job just like you do and savings just mm-hmm. like you do. They're put into the same exact box. What I've told people immediately is credit scores that go and no go. If they, because you'll get a lot of times of, can I use my credit score and their income? No. Absolutely yeah. not. If they don't have a qualifying credit score, they cannot have their income utilized yeah. on any mortgage type, right? There's yeah. no mortgage type mm-hmm. I know of that they can dispel the credit. Not score. anymore. Yeah, not not <laughs> anymore. Yeah, we a whole other video on that pre 2008 mortgages. All right, how to choose the best home for the next five to seven years? We're in the home now. Let's say we've gotten through the weeds, we've gotten a pre approval. We're now looking at properties. Yep. How how do I make a good decision on a property that I'm going to be, on average, being in there for the next three, five, seven years, but inevitably putting a 15 or 30 year note on? Yeah, well, you said it specifically, like, I need to, you need to think for the long term, like, hey, I have to make this work for the next seven years. If your family plans on growing, you need to be able to accommodate for that. Mm -hmm. I would say in the sense of if you are only looking for five to seven years, think of something that's going to help build equity in those five to seven years. So something that's structurally sound, but you can still do fixer upper little things, fresh paint, new flooring, fix the cabinets, something that can still be financed, but build as much equity as you can in those five to seven years. I love that. And back to the military conversation, that's a really good one because then you end up with a property that's easy to rent yeah. and easy to manage. Um, so when you're showing a home to a client, what are the things y'all are looking for in the home to to keep the client safe and to make them aware of certain things? Like I know for one, uh, I, I got this from Veronica, um, who's on our team, who's excellent at things like this. Uh, but looking at, you know, the walls and the corners and the ceilings and, and every line in the structure of the property to make sure everything's 90 degree right angle, like nothing should be corked off, anything like that. Mm-hmm. Of course, you don't want waviness or anything mm-hmm. like that. But if you see a home starting to cork off, that means something's foundationally an yeah. issue. You don't uh, want hills in your floor. Never, never. <laughs> no, but if she said it right. I mean, if you look like you have a doorway that's askew or a wall that's leaning or Floors that look like they're at a slant. Yeah, you put a marble on it, it's going to roll away. It doesn't necessarily mean that the floors are bowing or anything like that. It means that a, a portion of the house is sitting higher or lower than it did previously. Correct. It is settled. And it's something to look for. What are other things y'all are looking for? I, I immediately walk the exterior of the home. Um, just see if there's anything that's going to be a large permeation as far as the house. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's going to be causing issues in the long run because if your house isn't sealed, it's going to be end up being a high risk of damage later on um and the next thing i look at are just like gaps in the floor or gaps inside trim or foundation and seeing if there's any issues that are going to be causing it to not be structurally sound later on that's a huge and, one and and mm-hmm. and, I, and i'm explaining all these things to my clients letting them know like hey these are the things that i look for and what you should be paying attention to too but also i am not a structural engineer and i'm not an inspector you should take those people's <laughs> uh opinions more than mine i also look at the ceilings to make sure there's no uh water damage it's a big you one know whether it's past or present. And then I always turn on appliances to make sure that they work. We've recently just went through a cold, like, you know, snow and all that. And half the vacant homes that we went to, the waters, the pipes weren't working. Mm, Pipes froze. So Keep those sinks dripping. Yeah. Yeah. So little things like that. 
Um, and I also look to see if there's any, you know, I'll turn on the sinks and I'll look through to make sure that there's no leaks down there too. Cause that's a, a common one. one. It's a big one. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of the things we're mentioning, the water damage up top, things in the basement, under the sink that it's sometimes not the fault of the homeowner at the time of the seller. These are things you don't notice as you live in a property for three, six, five, seven years. I like to find those things at the listing appointments too. Yeah. Those things, I, you'll find them all the time and you'll point at the drips and, at the eight foot ceiling and they'll be like, oh, I didn't even know that was there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause you don't look up at your own ceiling. Yeah. You don't. Mm -hmm. um, but those are great things to look for. You mentioned inspections and appraisers. I want to touch on that. I like to also get in the roof. I like to get up in the attic Look at the underside of the sheathing, see if we have any leaks there, because that's another thing that's going to come up in the home inspection. And I get the question, I know you guys get too, of like what the inspection is going to be looking for. Mm -hmm. we, we know how to draw it out to them. You, know, you have cosmetic and safety, you have cosmetic, safety, minor, and major. Cosmetics, what it sounds like, anything decorative, they're not going to be asked to I fix mean, that. this is all a visual yeah. inspection of stuff that they can 100%. see. Um, it's not like they're going to be probing the walls or anything. Absolutely. Like, unless you get like specific... <laughs> to do that but that's a whole nother thing yeah. but it's it's just a visual expert that is certified in this area of expertise that's going to be overviewing your entire house from top to bottom and doing stress tests along the road yeah. along the way so let, let's go into this question do i need inspections and who fixes the repairs that are found hmm. um and before that i want to give the definition so so cosmetics yep. decorative not going to get fixed if, if they find cosmetic things that are wrong with the home deal with it. It's not going to be that expensive if it's on that list. Um, safety, guardrails, staircases, things that have to do with the safety of you living there. Exposed wires, open walls. Need to get taken care of. Minor. These aren't quite cosmetic, but they're not deemed necessary to fix to get this home financed. Mm -hmm. And then major. Major is anything that has to do with the long-term value or the instant livability of that property. And if it inter interweaves with either of those two factors, it's going to be considered major. It could be a roof, electric, water, mold. could be something like to do with a WDI, uh, wood-destroying insects. Uh, you could even have, like you said, like a, an outlet issue or a, the toilet could be loose. These are considered major. Now, when someone finds those repairs, the inspector comes in, does his visual inspection for three to four hours. You attend or not attend. doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, you're going to get this summary of major, minor, safety, and cosmetic. It's a long report. It is a long mm -hmm. report. So you know everything about that home inside yep. and out. The major summary, who's fixing it? Depends. Okay. Depends on what? Let's talk about it. Uh, so it all depends on the situation and negotiations. Okay. Now, if it was deemed in there that you checked yes, there I, I want a home inspection contingency on, on the actual house. Yes. Um, that automatically means that you guys can you sub submit for repairs. There's now, where are you making that decision to, to ask... You, you mentioned what, what section of that? A section of what? The agreement of sale. In the, the in the offer? Yes. Okay, so when we're submitting our offer, that's when we're making that decision. Yes. Okay, and it's a decision as to whether or not we want a home inspection contingency? Which means that you can back away from this contract if, if you guys cannot come to terms on negotiations about what happens with the inspection report. W exactly. Yep, absolutely. And I'll mention within that same document that though it's negotiated, it does state that if any of the major repairs aren't going to be fixed and paid for by the seller, that the buyer can back out. Yes. Yeah. And receive their deposit check back. Yes. There are times, though, where the seller doesn't fix everything. Yeah. That happens. There are even times where the buyer walks in, loves the property inside and out, and is okay with buying it without an inspection. How Which do you guys I feel about that? I mean, I don't always encourage it. I would never encourage it. But in this market, especially right now with rates going lower, mm -hmm. I'm personally seeing multiple offers again. And the offers that are winning are either waiving or doing information purposes only for their inspections. At the end of this video, we're going to talk about how to submit a winning or how to get your offer accepted. It's like the last topic. So let's save that. But that's sure. a great topic to, to yeah. hit on. Um, what do you think about people waiving inspections? I, I, I'd never recommend it. Mm -hmm. um, but... From time to time, like she just said, it's the way that you're going to be able to win an offer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So I have my next topic here um, of best showing tips and tricks to make the most of your time and avoid surprises. How do you make the most of your showing tours outside of just walking through and looking and be like, okay, cool bedroom. Like, oh, it's a nice <laughs> kitchen. Like, how do you make the most of your time in these properties? Because this is somebody else's home. You are utilizing a real estate agent wh who's, you know, on unpaid time, kind of. Uh, you know, to, to show the properties. How do you make the most of it? 
I, you know, look through the property, make sure inspection wise, like what's going to be dinged, what's not. But I also ask them, you know, what is your pros and cons? What do you like about this house? What do you dislike? So that moving forward, we're not constantly looking at properties that you have no interest in. We can figure it out. And, you know, from that one property. Yes. Do you like it? Why don't you like it? Okay, move the on. The feedback, the yeah. conversation between you and your realtor of trust is big. Yeah. Uh, make sure that you're pre-approved when you're looking at looking at trying to purchase a home. Mm -hmm. Like, why would you be looking at a house if you cannot submit an offer towards it? You cannot submit Absolutely. an offer if, if you if you're not pre-approved. Um, and if it's a property that you immediately know you're not going to submit an offer and you would never live here, stop looking at the house and leave. Like, and not only pre-approved. <laughs> I just need to say, <laughs> so um, there's right so now. chaos right now. It's fine. We're I trying to get cannoli. Oh, what's up? Yeah, I do. I do have to say, I got a tip because I have a showing at twelve. Oh, love that. So we're we're we got like you got ten more minutes. Yeah. Okay, we got ten more minutes. We're gonna roll through this. Our our loft dog cannoli <laughs> snuck into the studio. Um, all right. So, um, I love the communication. Yeah. Figuring out if this is it. Why is it not or why is it so you can better adjust for the next And I time would say here. before going to the showing, even though you are pre-approved, if you're looking at that top dollar of your pre-approval, figure out what the price range that monthly payment's going to be before you start seeing all these homes. Because then you're going to love a home and even though you are qualified for it, you're going to see the mortgage and you're going to ha possibly hate it and yeah. not want it. And I, then you've wasted your time. And yeah, <laughs> kind of piggybacking off of what she just said, if you're working with a lender that will not give you payment estimates amount with the amount that you're trying to purchase with, like let's just say your pre-approvals amounts up to 350, but they're but they're kind of withholding the amount that you would be paying if you wanted to pay for like 290. Ugh, yeah, like just run. switch. Yeah, yes. switch. Um, not a topic we're covering. Little side topic: big banks versus lenders. I, local lender. Local lender. Local if lender. somebody does not, if I don't have somebody's cell phone number as far as the lender goes, that's going to be answering the phone on nights and weekends, mm. I cannot work with them. Preach. I will work with them. <laughs> NAR, I will work with them. <laughs> just for compliance sake. Um, all right, we're going to go lightning round, all right? So I want each of you just to give your take on this, all right? For anyone listening, if we want more deep insight on this, I, you can reach out to both of you on Instagram, yeah. pat.loft. <laughs> oh Patty man, cakes Patty Cakes 429. Loft. 420. Perfect. 420. <laughs> 429. All right. Looking to buy in 2025. We'll save that one. All right. When is the best time to buy? Yesterday. Yesterday. <laughs> oh, I don't know now. Now, no, no. I don't know. It, <laughs> it's yeah, it's, it's whatever sounds, yeah. is best for you at the end of the day. Absolutely. Whenever you can afford it. Yeah, yeah. whenever you can afford it, it's not going to kill you. When, yes. uh, yeah, exactly. When you can afford it, it's best to own a home versus renting. Yeah. Uh, what's a pre difference between a pre-approval and a final approval? Ooh. Like the, the initial document you're getting from maybe a rocket loan or something like yeah. that, a rocket mortgage versus, hey, we're going to give you the money for this mortgage. Yeah. Well, usually a pre-qualification and a pre-approval are similar, but not the same. A pre-qualification is basically somebody had a phone call conversation with you, got your numbers and all that information, did not go through the trouble to back it. That's where the pre-approval comes in is when they finally back it and they can say like, hey, I went through their documents. I verified their income. I pulled their credit. Yep. Here is yep. the amount that, that we can go for. Have tax returns. A final approval is when they literally like read you the riot act and go through your bank statements and everything for the last like 37 years. And <laughs> no, <not there. laughs> yeah. Last, uh, last two months of bank statements, last two months of pay stubs, last two years of W-2s and last two years of tax, uh, basically your tax statement. Yeah. Perfect. Um, what do I do if I feel buying a home in this market is impossible? Don't give up. Don't give up. Yeah, seriously, like, be opportunistic. But the thing is, be realistic with what your money can get you. Sure. If it's an issue with you not making enough income, find a way to make more money. And I yeah. know that's easier said than done, but... That's that's the biggest issue that we're seeing. Heard. And if you feel like it's just savings, I need to get more for savings. Keep pushing. You know, it's just temporary. Heard. You yeah. know, if you if you've got to sacrifice the little Starbucks trips and the gas, <laughs> we're not going to get into saving the coffee a day. Yeah, okay, Gen Z. <laughs> it's it's temporary. It's just temporary because I had to do that. Sure. And I got into a home, and it okay. was worth it. I hear you. So, uh, a realistic pre-approval amount to do some damage in Delaware? Like what's a number on that pre-approval that I should have I to, hate to do something? when somebody comes up to me and it's it's not your fault as far as- it's the, the lender, yeah. It's yeah, the, it's the lender. It's, yeah. it's not the client's fault for, for me having this gripe. It's the person that gave them the pre-approval. If mm -hmm. somebody comes up to me and they're just like, hey, somebody pre-approved me for $140,000 on an FHA loan. It's impossible. Yeah. 
What's the minimum that we would say is possible just in lieu of time? 215. 215? I was thinking 220. Yeah, 220, 215. All right. It's funny. That number used to be like 150. I know. Yeah. It's sad. All right. Uh, uh, Nishi question. When do you get to enter the home, put your furniture in, start getting actually into the property? A lot of people have questions around that. When there's disbursements of funds and the keys are handed to you after you sign it at settlement. Boom. What's settlement? Is that saying that's used that's a lot of words? That's when you sit in front of a lawyer and they read you a bunch of paperwork. And if it's a government back loan, like an FHA, VA, or USDA, you're going to sign so much effing paperwork, your hand's <laughs> going to hurt. Last two topics we're going to hit. Uh, how, things you should be doing if you're looking to buy in 2025 um, and best ways to get your offer accepted. But last couple little mentioned questions. Is Zillow the best option for home searching? No. No? What's the best no. option? Me. We'll just... um, <laughs> uh, me first. But seriously, if you're still, if you want to go outside your search parameters that you went over with your real estate agent, it's not a bad idea to go on Zillow and still do a little bit of research. Sure. Don't schedule an appointment through Zillow with the listing agent because you'll never get in contact with that person unless there's going to be another agent that pays Zillow a lot of money in order to get in contact with them. And if you just want to yell at the neighbor because they have their lights on <laughs> in your yard. <laughs> All right. Other costs that come with home ownership in Delaware. Other things outside of just that mortgage, home payments, uh, electric payments are going up a little bit. Yeah. You're about to say insurance, insurance, yep. taxes, mortgage insurance, yeah, PMI, um, utilities, yeah, lawn maintenance, lawn maintenance. Knowing that there's going to be depreciation of like assets on the home, so you're going to have to get them eventually fixed and repaired. Yeah, things like, like roof, uh, your own HVAC, and things like that nature. Okay. Any other thoughts? That's about it. Yeah. yeah. If you're not cleaning your own home, you need to have a cleaner. You're not cooking your own food. You need to have a cook. I mean, anything you don't want to do at the property, you're going to have to do. Outside of that, you know, utilities, insurance, taxes, all the things. There's, yeah. there's more that comes with it. Um, best realtor in Delaware to work with? Us. No, there can only be one. Sorry. Oh, then it's Quick me. pitch? It's me. You have oh. 20 seconds? Go. Quick pitch. You're going into your 20 I'm seconds. I'm the girl version of Patrick, and it's 10 times better. Wow. Ooh. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Patrick Cable. If, if you're looking to try and purchase a home here in the new future, my biggest thing is I want to help you out and I want to make sure that I can make this as seamless as possible. I want to try and make this as easy as possible and I want to try and get all the scariness out of the way. All the scariness is gone. I'm the girl version of that. <laughs> so 10 times better. All right, let's hit our last two topics because I feel like they're very Damn important. Damn it, I wasn't done. I'm sorry, you lost your pitch time. <laughs> How? What are the best strategies to getting your offer accepted? If uh, you can't win on purchase price, make sure it's the terms. Terms. Yeah. Make sure you can close as quick as possible. Make sure that it's not as scary for the person to accept your offer as possible. And make sure that you're being realistic with what you're asking for, like maybe making the inspection for informational purposes only try closing in 21 days and just like make make your offer look like something that somebody was just like wow we should pick that one yeah we took time on it and we you know we at loft we have cover letters and we take time we felt the document correctly yep. i'll say another couple local lender versus big bank yep. when that other agent sees a big bank pre-approval it gets scary um i'd say another one is in actually writing up the offer, the EMD, the deposit check, not a lot of people think about that, mm -hmm. but that's the skin you have in the game that ultimately you get back at the closing table. So putting some extra money into that in, is sometimes a really good option because you can use that money also for the down payment. So yeah. it can kind of serve two different uh, purposes. And I think you already mentioned it, but timeline, ask the seller what they want. Mm -hmm. And do I make it. that call every time I call the if listing agent. If they want a rent pack, yeah, yep. <laughs> let's talk about pack. it. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people don't make that call. You make that call. I make that call every time. All right. Last topic: If somebody is looking to buy in 2025, it's out of the cards for right now. They want to start getting their ducks in a row mm -hmm. for June of 2025. I got 16, 18 months starting from right now to get in the best position possible to buy a home. Go. Call a local realtor. Okay. You think you should call a local? Okay, I hear you. I'm going to argue, though. Pat.loft, you DM you and say, I want to buy a home 2025 20, in summer. You're on the phone with them the next day, if not that day. Same with you. Yep. Right? A lot of agents are not going to entertain that person. Just to be very honest. Mm -hmm. Just from inside the industry, you say that, even in your lead form, there's going to be a lot of agents who do not bother to text you. So I want to be very real and, and honest with anyone listening to this. Continue me off no nope. <laughs> what are you gonna do i want to be very clear because i want to make it clear what the industry is more than likely going to offer versus what you're about to say i want to be make that clear is probably going to be different so reach out to a realtor one that's redheaded and beautiful like you most likely and then what just basically have a conversation with me we're going to go over your situation and what we can do to put your put you in a better situation what i'm honestly probably going to do is because they're the expert with numbers mm -hmm. when 
the, the lenders. The lenders, got it. Lenders, Heard. White Cat Mortgage. Heard. Valerie Goertz is my girl. Okay. Um, <laughs> and just we're going to have sit down, probably powwow between the three of us, and between yourself, the client, me, your realtor, and the lender, we're just going to go over your options and kind of just be like, hey, this is what you should do, and you should do it. And if you're actionable about it. Actionable. And listen to what we tell you, and you can make it happen. We're going to put you in a better position. Just trust me. At the end of the day, the only way that me and Valerie both get paid is if you buy a home. I want to simpl- – can I simplify exactly what you just said? Yes. Save money, fix your credit. Yeah. And the lender and realtor conversation that you're going to have is going to set you up with the exact blueprint of how to do those two things right. Uh, because sometimes there's a certain amount you should have saved for what your goal of a home is. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be the same for everybody. For some people, paying off certain things may be the best option. For some people, it may be better somewhere else. So having that discussion with strategy and with humility, I think it's another one. A lot of people don't want to have the discussion until they're ready. And a lot of people won't get ready because they're not ready to have the discussion. And you might think paying off credit is the smarter option, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's so not. So talking maybe to Maybe having lender, more reserves is the better so option. So important. So important. Save your money. Save your money, <laughs> build your credit. If, that, those, if you could just have those two things and have that early on conversation. Yeah. And, and if you don't have a realtor of trust or you, you've tried or you've never even thought, hey, I'm this far out, I should even do it, reach out. Pat.loft, pattycakes428.loft, whatever. Uh, 429. And 429. Go, yeah, don't look, 428 sucks. I, <laughs> I hate her. She <laughs> is, uh, doesn't even exist, probably. Probably. Appreciate y'all taking the time. Mm-hmm. Last closing thoughts to someone who's, again, thinking of buying a home this coming year, next year. Go. Keep, keep pushing. You've got it. Headstrong. I mean, honestly, our whole position inside this job and the reason why I feel like us as licensees are able to like help people buy and sell homes is because it's not a very well-educated process. Like not a lot of people mm-hmm. know about this kind of stuff. Yeah. And the whole point of my position is to not make a single decision for you whatsoever. I don't make a single decision for you. All I do is just be like, Hey, here's what you're doing. Here's the education about it behind what you're doing and why. And here are decisions that you basically have. And it's up to you to make that decision. It's up to you when you want to buy a house. All I'm here is, to, all, all I'm doing here is just to help you. the fiduciary. I'm literally yeah. just the guy that's just like, hey, I legally am bound to make sure that we work together and I do everything up to the most utmost ethics and just get you inside a house and you make decisions on what you're supposed to do after that. Yeah, after, through, through. you're absolutely correct. You laid the, the best decisions out. I love how you said that. You're giving them the knowledge on the decisions they can make based off the situation they're presently in, which thankfully, you know, we've gone through hundreds of different times. So we're able to lay out, you know, the best, probably most optimal options. Yes. Anything you'd add to that? No. Spot on. You're the, uh, what, the girl version of him just better? The girl, bur- <laughs> the you, girl you version, but better. You guys heard it here better. first. All right. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Awesome, guys. Awesome. Yes.